help, uh, tremendous help of a family friend. I found my way to um, a private school in, uh, uh, not a boarding school, but a, but a private day school in, in Philadelphia, which turned out to be great for me because it was a small environment and um, I had obviously was going through a, a bit of a challenge in life, just you know, sort of regrounding. At that time, I had zero, I was 13, I had no idea about my family's finances, so I was um, constantly uh, of the thought that I had to be self-sufficient. So I think from that moment forward, I felt like I really needed to figure out a way to support myself and be able to support my family over time. And that kind of consciousness, I think, still in some weird ways drives me still. So, um, th but those, those are just some formative things that, that happen and they tend to inform how you behave. So not only financially being able to actually go to that school, which was transformative in terms of allowing you to take the next step in your uh, academic journey, yeah. but um, actually the testing didn't go so well, right? Oh my God. Um, I had <laughs> So it was the spring of that year, my father had passed away and I had gone on a camping trip and had a severe case of poison ivy, like half my body covered in poison ivy. So I sit for the admissions test. It's like a standardized test for all the private schools in Philadelphia. And um, I think I scored around 60% on the, on the, on the test. And the, like the minimum score that, would, that the school that I ended up going to would consider was in the 90s. So the guy who was basically doing us a favor because he knew my father sat down with me and he said, um, I've spent enough time with you to know that this is not reflective of your, of your capacity. So you should just take a breath and relax. <laughs> so, um, but it was, a, it was a, that also put me on my heels. He actually essentially talked my, you know, talked me into the school as a favor to the head, from the headmaster of the school. And so I showed up you know, the next September. To say that I was on, on edge is probably uh, the understatement. I, I always had, you know, hyper-consciousness that I couldn't fail, that I had to work really hard. And I did, I worked really, really hard. And, um, and you know, school ended up actually, I don't think I was a particularly good student up until that time, but I really clicked into gear at that point. But that motivator of, you know, not having the confidence that you're walking in and sort of I got this. I never, I never felt like I got this. I always felt like I had to work that much harder to make sure that you know I was going to be successful. So it ended up okay, um, and uh, you went on to Cambridge and studied at, at Harvard. What your thought process um, as you're coming out of school, career choices? You know, uh, as we think about kind of how everybody decides what they want to do. Uh, maybe some of it starts with the process of elimination. Here's what I don't want to do, and then yeah. you kind of get to, to what do you do. So how were you thinking about the world um, when you were in college, and, and what do you want to do next? So when I was early in college, I thought I wanted to go to law school. I'm not sure what possessed me to think that initially, but my sister was working as an administrator at a law firm, and um, she said that if I went and studied and learned how to do legal research, I could work there for the summer. So during my freshman year between freshman and sophomore years, I worked at a law firm. And it didn't take long. Within a month, I realized there's zero chance I wanted to be a lawyer. So that, that, was, that was my first dream dashed. <laughs> um, and otherwise, I didn't know. I didn't really have a clear idea in my mind. Um, nothing at school was vo vocationally oriented. It was all sort of liberal arts generalized. Um, so. What I, what I started thinking about is I, went, I wanted to just have an opportunity to learn as much as I could across as many different um, areas, excuse me, as possible. So some, somehow I ended up hearing about the Manufacturers Hanover um, you know, Analyst Program, um, and someone mentioned to me that they had a really good training program. So. Meanwhile, I didn't know anything about manufacturers handover. In fact, I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a big industrial company because it's manufacturer or something, right? I didn't realize it was a bank. Um, and so I realized they were coming on campus, and I immediately signed up for an interview. And then I realized, did some research before the interview, and started thinking to myself, well, I never really considered banking. Um, but these programs seem really great, so I should go and look into them. And um, 
that interview went really badly. I uh, never got a call back from them. Um, and I ended up you know, going through the process and went to what was then called the First Boston Corporation, now absorbed into Credit Suisse, and went to Wall Street. Um, and really my motivation was exposure. I just wanted to learn. So the experience of Wall Street was um, both um, positive because um, you met um, a pretty young girl named Rachel. <laughs> right. that was there. Um, you should talk wife. a little bit about that story in terms of how, how you met and, and the um, instant um, lack of attraction she had for you. <laughs> um, and then, Thanks, uh, and then we should talk that. about kind of the, the journey that, that taught you what you really wanted to kind of think about doing for the rest of your life. Yeah. So um, I really appreciate you raising this. This yeah, is really helpful. <laughs> I think there's videotape as yeah, well, so oh, you can good. play it back off. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I have to make sure I know, I know Rachel does not end up with this link. Um, yeah, it was pretty much hate at first sight. Um, uh, you know, and this is, this is another life lesson, like don't tell a book by its cover is the old adage. Well, in this case, we're going to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary in September, so uh, that, that gives you a clue. Um, yeah, it, w it really was. Um, I uh, had applied to Princeton, uh, and she went to Princeton, and I didn't get in. And I always really, it always really bothered me that I didn't get into Princeton. It was really close to where I grew up, and I thought that would be a better solution so I could stay closer to my family. Um, of course, I have no regrets about going to Harvard, of course, but um, that always really ate away at me. And she declared to me, actually, she's a very straightforward person, for any of you who met her, um, that she had never met anybody at, that had gone to Harvard that wasn't, you'll excuse my expression, but she's also pretty blunt. Uh, an asshole. So, and I, I was a little taken aback by this, and um, we sort of agreed not to be friends. Like, we just <laughs> said, okay, you know what? Have a nice life. We were both new analysts, and, um, and uh, so fast forward six months, um, we, the, one of the great honors at that time was to be tapped to co-lead the next year's recruitment process. It's a huge honor. Like they, they picked the two, two of the highest performing analysts of that year to, to go and lead the effort. So I get called by the vice president who uh, at the time was leading recruitment, and he asked me to come to his office. And so for a glimmer, for a moment, I thought, oh, maybe I'm getting tapped to do this, because I'd never worked with the guy. And so at that time, First Boston had all glass offices, so I get off the elevator, I'm walking towards his office, and Rachel's sitting in his office, and I thought, uh-oh, if that's actually what he's, I'm here to talk to him about, and she's the other person I have to work with? <laughs> um, so to cut a long story short, um, yeah, so it turned out that that's what it was, and I, and I said, do you mind if I give this a little thought, and I'll come back to you? And of course, Rachel said to me, she immediately re realized that her initial suspicions about me were correct. <laughs> who wouldn't just immediately take, the, take that opportunity? And he's looking at me like, are you kidding me? Like, what's wrong with you? So seriously, this is like, I couldn't make this up. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I ended up doing it with Rachel. We were very successful. At that time, Wall Street was going gangbusters. This was the mid 80s, 86. Um, so our class was 35 analysts. The class that we hired was 65 analysts. So we really uh, increased significantly at that time. Um, and by the end of it, I was asking her out to dinner like every day. Um, and she resisted and she resisted, and, but finally we ended up um, having the opportunity to start dating. Um, so if you fast forward now 30 years later, um, here we are with I'll three kids. And, yeah. I'll walk down. The experience um, at First Boston was also revealing, but in, in, uh, or Credit Suisse was revealing, uh, but, but in a different way. Um, you're working on a big project, um, and um, your senior leader uh, on that team um, that you were working with, uh, you had an opportunity uh, to raise capital around it, and the bank itself wanted to invest in it. Talk, you know, talk about that kind of that situation, you know, first time that you're in that situation, uh, the outcome there, and how that kind of changed your programming in terms of what you yeah. were looking for next. Yeah, that was pretty uh, a pretty important or pr pretty stark learning lesson for me. Um, I was, it was one of the first big deals I was working on. I was doing international corporate finance stuff. Um, and we were advising a firm, a company, to, on a capital raising exercise. And um, 
the bank itself, as Mitch just described, the bank itself decided that it was a really interesting investment. They wanted to make a direct investment, which meant that we, the, the banking team, had to go and present to the investment committee of the bank. The investment committee, and First Boston at that time was a publicly traded company, big balance sheet and so forth. Um, and the investment committee is made up of the CEO of the company um, and several super smart people. They, they, they got like the head of products from capital markets, the head of M&A, all the people who had the biggest brains pretty much were around the investment committee table. Um, and there's one guy in particular who was sort of known as the um, boy wonder, brilliant guy. So me and the vice president that I was working for, we show up and we present the deal and this boy wonder starts questioning, you know, he starts asking a series of questions and he's raising stuff like concepts in corporate finance that I've never heard of because I'm like a year into my job and uh, I'm still learning. So what happened is during the meeting, he turns to um, the vice president. I, actually, I was sitting between the vice president and, and this guy. And he turns to the vice president and he said, well, and he asked him a direct question about one of the financial attributes of the deal. And um, unceremoniously, um, the guy uh, basically throws me under the bus because he, does, he can't answer the question. And uh, it was traumatic for me because I'm sitting here with you know, the, a room full of super senior people looking like an idiot and really feeling a tremendously deep sense of ignorance and resentment now because this guy just did something that I thought was really not just unkind but like unprofessional, you know? If you don't know the answer, don't, don't blame it on me because I'm, how could I know the answer? So at that moment, I just like crystallized in my mind that if I ever had a chance to lead people or manage people, I would never treat them that way. Because that, um, it's, it's one thing to have, you know, have to work through a sense of confidence. It's a different thing to get thrown under the bus in a very sort of terrible way like that. So that left a huge mark on my, in my consciousness about how to treat people who are, you're responsible for. And the second thing that came out of that was I thought to myself, geez, I never want to be in a position where I feel um, like I, I don't really understand the underlying concept. I really want to have a skill set that's rock solid, like complete foundational skill set. Um, and, um, and so th those, that, it was a very, very uh, formative experience, pretty traumatic. Um, but coming out of that, I had clarity that I did want to learn more and I wanted to come out of whatever I did, so uh, business school, um, with a rock solid skill set because I never wanted to be in a position where I didn't know. Um, but I also realized at that time that um, I was just going to need to work that much harder to make sure that whatever position I ended up putting myself in, that I was prepared, that I had done all the work, that I thought about all the different perspectives. And that's still with me today. I'm a little obsessive. I have a bunch of colleagues sitting here. They can probably attest to this um, about really making sure that we've nailed down the things that we need to. Right, right. And there, there is thematically, um, as we continue with, uh, with the journey, uh, very uh, important uh, parts of that uh, storyline that ties to exactly that. So you arrive at University of Chicago. Yep. Um, the thesis, um, as, uh, as we've discussed, is that this was a, a school that um, really had a significant amount of engineers that kind of matriculated there and right. kind of the process oriented. You know, give us, a, uh, give us kind of what's going through um, your mind as you arrive at the University of Chicago, you know, to get your um, graduate degrees in, in business and finance and, and kind of how you're thinking about the next stage of your career. Um, so I went to UC, for the very reasons that we just talked about, which is, I, you know, it was really a rigorous program, very um, focused on skills development, not so much on, at that time, case study was sort of the, the flavor du jour, and Harvard Business School was, you know, famous for the case study method. And there's value in case studies, um, but again, from that experience that I described to you, I, I just didn't want to, I, I wanted to have the most solid skill set that I could possibly build. And so that's why I chose Chicago. Um, and I really liked a lot of aspects of Wall Street, the deal aspects and the deal dynamic aspects. 
it's exciting, it's um, fast paced. But the one thing that I didn't um, like as much and really wanted more of was real involvement in businesses, like more deep involvement in businesses and learning more aspects of business, not just uh, financial aspects. So I ended up um, really seeking out other things that I could do that were really broad. So I looked at super big companies um, to see if I could go work for a major corporation and get a broad um, experience base. And I also um, thought about consulting. And that's ultimately what I ended up doing for the summer. Um, it wasn't McKinsey, it was yeah, BCG. Yep. Yeah? Yep. Um, so I ended up working for BCG for the summer and loved it in, in many ways. It was really stimulating. I got to learn a lot about business, not just financial aspects and deal aspects. Um, and as I was coming out of, um, as I went into my second year, I basically came to the conclusion that I didn't want to go back to a banking job. And I didn't, as much as I enjoyed consulting, I wanted to do something that was kind of a hybrid. And so I went to talk to the, I, you know, the, the folks at BCG were recruiting me to come after school. And I went to them and said, here's the kind of stuff that I want to do. And they, um, they said, well, uh, we don't know how to satisfy that at BCG, but you know, we've got a partner who left here and works for the Pritzker family. And they sort of do kind of like what you described. So, and they gave me his name and number. They were very gracious about it. And I contacted him. And um, I, I seem to have shown up in a lot of meetings in my life where ignorance was really the dominant theme here. So <laughs> I'm not sure how, what that means. Um, but so my, my interview with the Pritzkers uh, was uh, sort of along the lines of showing up for, I met this fellow and one thing led to another. And um, I, my, my first real, the first time I met Jay Pritzker, who's pictured here on the left, um, and his son Tom is on the right, uh, was in 1989, and it was the spring, sort of uh, February, March of 1989, and I walked into his office, um, didn't know I was gonna meet him that day, and he's sitting there with a lawyer, a financial advisor, and the head of the machinist union at Eastern Airlines. Eastern Airlines at that time was in, in now I'm really dating myself, uh, was in bankruptcy. Can I, wait, wait, before we go there, yep. you show up at the office, yep. And you've actually never physically met the person you've been talking to on right. the phone. You no, arrive, yeah. so you arrive to meet, you arrive to meet him. Maybe he's got another meeting to go to. Yeah. But now he says, hey, you're going to meet with the patriarch of the firm, Jay right. Pritzker, right. who you've also heard about but never met. Right. And then you arrive in his office, yeah. and you sit down, and he's having a meeting. Right. So I'm, and, and it's in, in Jay's actual office. He had a little meeting table. And so I sit down. He introduces me. Um, of course, he's introducing me to himself for the first time, too. So I sit through like an hour and a half meeting, and they're talking about trying to convince Jay to sponsor a plan of reorganization to bring Eastern Airlines out of bankruptcy. And I thought it was fascinating, except I knew nothing about airlines. I knew nothing about bankruptcy. I knew nothing about unions. Uh, never sat with a bankruptcy lawyer in my life before. And they're, I mean, the whole, they speak a di speaking a different language, and. It was wild. It was like, um, I don't know. I don't know how many of you know the, the original Star Wars movies, but there's that bar scene where you've got like really <laughs> wild creatures walking around. That's what it felt like. So they left this stack of information. And so Jay gets up after the meeting's over. He, shows the, he said, Mark, just wait here for a second. He shows the other folks out, comes back, and says, um, so what do you think? And I said, honestly, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know anything about the industry, so it's really impossible for me to say. And he said, well, that's OK. Why don't you take this and come back, this is on a Tuesday, and come back on Friday and tell me what you think. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my interview. Uh, so, so three days later, I showed up. And apparently, I didn't completely embarrass myself because he invited me back. Um, and then. Um, but that was a pretty stressful time. I, I worked pretty much nonstop <laughs> from Tuesday to Friday, trying to learn the learn bankruptcy and learn the airline industry all on the same at the same time. But the one thing that was true is that it was super stimulating, so interesting, very complex stuff, um, and a really interesting you know uh, opportunity to sit with someone who's got a tremendous level of, of experience. So 
um, again, you know, kind of dealing with that sense of ignorance, but also recognizing that it's it's very powerful force and it can be a really good thing. Um, and um, ultimately, you know, so it was very uncharacteristic. They never hired someone right out of school. He called a few references from my first Boston days that he knew personally. Um, luckily, I'd worked directly with them as opposed to just in their departments. And um, I got a job offer and I took it right away, almost entirely because of the, how I felt about the people. Um, it was a sense of family. Um, so my family, uh, my, my dad had his own business, my brothers have their own businesses. Virtually um, everyone in my, on my dad's side of the family, they, all my uncles and cousins and so forth, all have their own businesses. So we come from a background of entrepreneurship, but also a familial environment where you know, that family feeling is um, part of the business environment. And that's what I felt. And um, not to mention the fact that obviously they were super successful and I got to work directly with them. It was kind of like an unbelievable opportunity. Um, so lucky for me, I didn't completely fall on my face in I I assessing Eastern Airlines. So this was in 1989. Right. And uh, you, you married the pretty young analyst from, uh, <laughs> right. from First Boston in 91. There she is. <laughs> that, was, that, uh, that picture is from 1989 or 1990, something like that. We ended up going uh, cross-country skiing in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. It's a great, great trip. Um, and we got married um, in 1991, so 25, 25 years this year. So it's an important time uh, of your life for a lot of reasons, right? You're, 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 um, you were meeting and indoctrinating really your family unit um, at the same time uh, your career trajectory and, um, and joining this family business um, with you know, such a visionary leader um, like, like Jay. Um, and, you know, kind of true to form, going back through the characteristics that you've described, um, you feel, um, you know, honored to be a part of that organization. Um, I think you probably left out that, you know, the, the Boeing exercise was only one of a few exercises that you yeah. actually had to go through before you got the job offer and got right. hired. Yeah. Um, let's l talk about a little bit about, um, you're now there, you got married in 2001, 9-11 had dramatic um, impact on our country, on our industry. Um, certainly what is today Hyatt Hotels existed um, in, in a much different form during that time period. That's really kind of your first um, understanding of what was happening in the hospitality industry, yeah. right, through that time period. Hawaii was, you know. Yeah, so this is actually yeah, early 1990s, so the first Gulf War, yeah. um, and um, I remember vividly sitting, so the, there's a dining room in the office and the Hyatt executives would eat there and the family office people, us, you know, those of us working with the family directly would, would eat in the same place. And there was like a completely shocked, you know, environment, like Hawaii was running in the 20s in terms of occupancies and because the Japanese uh, government had basically banned travel and it was a really tense time in the world. Um, not that we haven't had plenty of tense time since then, but um, the whole industry just felt really right. under attack. And so I didn't know the industry. I, I wasn't part of Hyatt, but I was around. Um, and, um, you know, I think it was interesting to actually be uh, aside that or abreast of that as the company worked through what they were going to do and how they were going to approach that kind of environment. Right. Right. Your first deal that you had the ability to kind of lead, um, that was also a transformational event for you. Yeah. Talk, talk yeah. to us about that. So um, it was a, um, we, we did many different things uh, in the family office. So we had a big portfolio of companies that we oversaw, but we also m invested a lot in new companies. And um, a deal came across Jay's desk and he gave it to me to pursue. And it was, uh, the deal was to joint venture with an Israeli company um, called Israel Aircraft Industries. They had just developed a new business jet. Um, which today is owned by Gulfstream and the G280. Uh, for those of you who are private plane owners in the, in the audience, you may know that plane. Um, and so the program, uh, the engineering had been done, but they hadn't actually built a, 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 the first prototype. They hadn't flown the plane. And they needed a lot of money, and they needed a US partner because the US market was the number one market, and they needed someone who had tremendous flexibility in dealing with you know, an Israeli state-owned company. So I worked on this deal for two, not quite two years, maybe uh, 15 to 18 months before we actually entered into the deal. 
it was very um, difficult uh, to structure. We had lots of, it was a very complicated tax structure because we were trying to protect our downside, but also deal with them as a state-owned company. And um, we did the deal, uh, invested a pretty sizable chunk of change, and I led, I led the deal process. Um, but during the deal process and during the startup of the company, we went through um, so many problems, so many challenges, and um, not just, I mean, actually our partnership with IAA turned out to be fine, but you know, challenging to have a partner that you have to deal with in, in that way, um, just commercially, just really big challenges commercially. And um, you know, Rachel really pushed me hard to stick with it because uh, several times I was ready to sort of throw in the towel and just declare a loss and move on. Um, and, you know, her attitude was, you've, you've invested a lot of time and effort, you, you really need to go and prove to yourself, basically, what your own capacity is. Maybe in the same vein, you know, resiliency and adaptability, right? So you have to face that you're going to run into all kinds of problems along the way. The question is, you know, how do you deal with that? And, um, I, I mean, I've been tested in many different ways over the course of my life, but frankly, Honestly, sincerely, up until this time in my life, I felt like things had gone pretty well and smoothly, and I was privileged to be able to go to the schools that I did and get the jobs that I did. Um, but this deal really tested sort of something different, I think, which was, you know, kind of the what are you made of truly when you're faced with something that looks like a complete disaster. And um, so, um, you know, largely with her support, I was able to um, sort of work my way through it. And, um, and it was, again, by dint of just intense work. I didn't, there was no flash of genius, no you sort of intervention from on high, even though I prayed a lot during those days. <laughs> um, it was just a, a ton of really hard work. And, um, you know, thankfully, uh, we got lucky in a few, got a couple lucky breaks um, the economy was doing pretty well, actually, through that period of time, and we caught a good wave of a resurgence in business jets. So the company started to really get some traction, and, uh, but I realized that, you know, quickly, that as much as I was feeling more and more confident about the business, I was watching what was going on um, in the industry with Gulfstream and Bombardier and Vesso, and I said, we, we've got to get out of this business. We have to actually combine this with another group because of aftermarket support, a bunch of things that are specific to that business. So we sold the company to Gulfstream, closed the deal in late June of 2001, and 9-11 occurred three, two months later. And let's just say that business jet orders went to zero like that. So um, again, super lucky. But um, meanwhile, the deal turned out to be a great success. Um, we, we were able to get all of our money back through the structure that we per, 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 you know, put together, and it was a good multiple of our investment. And, um, and it, most of all, it was just like a huge learning experience. So. so as you're going through this time, you're clearly building uh, tremendous amounts of um, respect uh, and, and loyalty within the Pritzker organization and the family itself. Um, perhaps... Um, you know, unprepared, however, for uh, when the patriarch of the family passed away in, in 1999. Yep. And um, this family business that you joined, you know, that, that embodied all these virtues, um, began to change. Yep. Um, talk to us about that time, just the, the turmoil within um, the family and having to deal with that. Now someone that had been there, you know, for that period of time and, it, and had, had grown to have that level of trust and respect. Yeah. Um I guess, you know, there's no substitute for experience, shared experience. So I think having lived through that business jet business uh, deal and a bunch of other things that also happened around the same time, my, um, I became maybe more of a known quantity to a lot of people in the family because they understood, they, they watched kind of the turmoil I went through and um, that helped give me some credibility with them maybe more so than just being an employee, um, someone who they thought had some additional capacity to, to do some other things. 
Um, and then Jay passed away, which was really traumatic, um, especially for me, because I had worked so closely with him. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's, you all probably have heard something about the infamous family food fight amongst the, uh, amongst the Pritzker family members. Um, and it was a very, very bad period of time. There were threatened lawsuits, a couple of actual lawsuits that got filed along the way. Lots of discord. And um, it was a very large family enterprise. Um, and um, there, were, there was a mandate eventually to break, it, break this up and give people liquidity and give people an alternative to do something else, which really was hard because Jay's whole ethos and his whole attitude was about collective. You know, this is about one family, we're gonna work together, we're gonna end up being together. Um, of course, that was his philosophy. It's also true that a number of family members did not work in the family business. And I think that's where the friction really arose uh, because people, some people felt disenfranchised, other people sort of had this awareness that they were entitled to or had some net worth available to them but didn't really have any ab ability to know what it was or access it. So all of those forces came together and we ended up coming together to, uh, to basically break up the family enterprise over a 10-year period. And that deal was signed in 2000. Uh, and one, and um, my group, the Pritzker organization, went to work, kind of unscrambling this gargantuan egg. <laughs> you know, it was like, how do you how do you separate a couple hundred companies that had been put together over fifty plus years? Um, so we got to work right away on the things that were going to take the longest time. Um, Hyatt was among those. Um, we got the Marmon Group into a situation in which that could be sold, it eventually was sold to Berkshire Hathaway. Hyatt was slated to go public. We sold off some other businesses. We spun some things out. Um, so it was a very tumultuous time, and I was sort of leading the uh, family meetings along the way, which was, you know, uh, pretty stressful, but uh, ultimately became uh, something that I felt good about because, you know, the professionalism with which we did it and the success that we had in doing it was really um, notable. And um, while there were still family frictions along the way, I think people truly did appreciate that we did, did a good job and did good work to do that. So that's kind of how. Were you telling me that um, the first meeting amongst the family, when you have such great, uh, such a great visionary patriarch, um, and then things um, go really south as quickly. Um, and dealing with a lot of money with uh, with a lot of folks. I think you yeah. mentioned that it was 42 people oh, yeah. in that first meeting. <laughs> yeah, there were there were uh, yeah something like 40 43 people or 44 people in the meeting, and there were 11 cousins, 11 family members. Um, so who were the other 33 people? And the answer is lawyers. Back to my decision not to go to law school. Um, so let's just say it was a pretty unpleasant first meeting. So you now become CEO of the Pritzker organization, um, an organization that you started um, sitting in Jay's office and you know with a box of documents, and um, and and you've now grown to uh, the CEO of a thirty billion dollar business with uh, ten employees. But there's something that's still gnawing on you a little bit. The Hyatt um, organization had come together through a lot of your, you know your efforts and the team's efforts, putting it together to where it actually could be a standalone organization. Uh, tremendous amount of work effort, and you were doing that you know as CEO of the Pritzker organization. What happened for you to make this transition? Um, so in 2006, Tom decided that he wanted to have a president and CEO of the newly combined Hyatt. So we pulled all the different pieces of Hyatt together, put it into one company. And uh, he was chairman and CEO, but he wanted a president and CEO, and he wanted to be chairman. And the then president of the company said, um, great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do something else right now. Um, so Tom uh, asked me to be interim president in the middle of 2006. And my Im immediate reaction was, OK, I'll do it, but I don't want to get stuck at Hyatt. Uh, that's l literally what I said to him. And, um, and uh, so to cut a very long story short, I. I came to really experience everything that I thought I knew about the culture of Hyatt, which was it was warm, it was about people caring for other people and a sense of care, it was about family, um, the Hyatt family, not just the Pritzker family, and um, I fell in love. I mean, I really did. It was all about it was all about the people as to why I made the decision. Sort of like my decision to work for the Pritzkers to begin with, it was really about the people. 
Um, so I was in. Um, besides which, the company, you know, how many opportunities do you have to, to become a part of something where you've got a 50-year lineage? The company was almost 50 years old. It was 49 years old when I joined. Um, but a completely new lease on life because it was a newly formed enterprise. The international business had just been joined with the North American business. All of the hotels that the Prisker's own were now back in the company. So you actually had like an enterprise put together for the first time to really operate as a hotel company focused on the hotel business, not one of a couple hundred portfolio companies spread out across a family enterprise. Um, so I just thought it was too amazing of an opportunity and thank God um, Tom felt the same way. Um, so he, um, you know, we had this discussion uh, in August or September, and I said, so about that search that you're running, because one of the things I said to him was, hey, I want to make sure that, you, that you're serious about the search. I want you to find the person you're going to hire so I can get back to, you know, building other businesses. And uh, so, you know, anyway, I, I went back to him and I said, look, um, I really would like to stay and do this if, you, if that suits you. And he said, well, I'm so relieved to hear you say that because I want you to stay. So it was like a perfect, um, perfect alignment. I got so lucky. Um, and, uh, you know, in typical Tom fashion, I can't say precisely what he said, because uh, it's a little um, edgy in terms of the language he used. But uh, as I was leaving his office, he said, oh, one more thing. Don't <laughs> screw it up. Um, he didn't use the word screw it up, but you can, you can just imagine. So of course, I, I laughed. And then I turned around, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> he's right. I can't screw this up. So. Um, so that's how it was. That's and, how it went. And you found your wheelhouse because um, here's uh, this very analytical, process-oriented, <laughs> um, you know, thoughtful. You know, I'll you know, uh, never be the smartest person in the room. Always outwork um, the room person that now um, is able to really show off his selfie game and. and <laughs> I know it's ways. incredible how many selfies are in this photo. <laughs> um, and 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 perhaps as, if you think back to it. The, the uh, experience at Credit Suisse in that room, thinking about leading people, yeah. um, entering into a family business that was driven by such a visionary patriarch that had been so successful, and seeing that get broken up um, for reasons you know, that, that, that gnawed at you, um, found, you know, made you find yourself in this people business. Yeah. Um, and this people industry, yeah. and being able to really connect yeah. all the things that were in your heart and, and, and in your mind together in one place. Yeah. I never thought about it that way. Honestly, that's, uh, that's, it makes, that's true. Um, it shouldn't surprise me that I'm so in love with the business and with the company, because you're right, it, it really is it, it is, it feels like home from that perspective, because it is about the people. Um, yeah. I, I never put it that way or thought about it that way, but you're absolutely right. Um, you've been a great shrink through this whole process, by the way. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I, appreciate that. <laughs> I really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. We'll go have beers later. We will. I, I'll need them. <laughs> so let's get to what I think you and I spend the most amount of our time talking about, yeah. right? Which is um, our greatest responsibility, yeah. um, our, um, our, our, most wonderful moments, and, and truly what we want to be known for um, as a husband and as a father, uh, for you, for Mara and Lena and Leo. Um, talk about your family. Talk about um, just you know how um, it has been for you um, to be all of those things um, through your career, through your life, and, and kind of what you know really that you want to leave behind. Um, so the, this is my family. I have two daughters and a son. Um, this was taking, taken probably three or four years ago. We tend to do adventure style holidays, vacations. Um, so those black weird things that we're wearing are spray skirts for kayaks that we were in. Um, so we were on some river risking our lives probably a little bit too much in that case. Um, some harrowing events occurred uh, later in that trip. but. At that time, we were all really happy. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's um, well, you know, I, you know, kids bring a whole different dimension to life, um, and I would say, you know, one of the things that um, I really um, have learned a lot 
uh, over the years is um, how to be aware of impact uh, that you have on your children. Uh, still to this day, honestly, because I did not grow up in a, I did not grow up in a company where I rose through the ranks and I completely understood what the shadow of a leader or the impact of position and title was because I worked for Jay Pritzker at, at a business school directly. So I didn't have this awareness that, you know, the, the title that you carry is, carries a big um, shadow, a big impact on people. So still to this day, I don't really, I have to remind myself about the impact of the title thing. Um, the one thing it's taken me a lot, lot longer to learn than, I, than it should have is the impact um, that your position as a parent has on your kids. And uh, lucky for me, my oldest daughter, who's in the middle there, is my life coach. Um, sorry. So um, I've gotten a lot of feedback from her over the years, uh, which has been great. Um, but you know, you really um, you come to appreciate um, how things that you say or things that you do set uh, a strong example for them. So um, that's really my, my learning, and I'm still learning it today. Um, but also, it's the most enduring and lasting impact because they're going to go on and have their own lives. And whatever they picked up along the way will continue to resonate. It's, I mean, frankly, it's sort of like what we've been discussing today, the stuff that I sort of learned from my experience with my grandparents or my parents or that guy at First Boston who I will never forget for bad reasons, but also good reasons. Um, these things are lasting. You know, they, they really, they do persist through your life. And um, I think unless you really remind yourself of that, it's really easy to sort of be a bit unconscious about it uh, and not really say tuned into what impact you do have. So I, I, I completely agree with what you said. The first word you used when you described it was a big responsibility, and I think that's true. Um, I don't necessarily feel like they are not self-sufficient, but I feel like how I show up as a human being really matters in their lives and will matter to others that they come into contact with. So anyway, um, it's been a tremendous blessing. I just really, uh, for any of you who are thinking about having kids, do it. I promise you, you won't, you won't regret it. Um, Mara gets back. She's actually just landed in D.C. Mark has not seen her for eight months because yeah. she did a, a study. That's yeah, why I got was, choked yeah, up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I've not seen Mara. Mara is my oldest, and I, she's been away for eight straight months. And she landed in Washington, D.C. I talked to her on the phone on the way here. Uh, so as soon as I'm out of here, I'm on a plane to D.C. to see her. So <sighs> it'll be great. <laughs> Um, Mark, if, um, if we think about um, our responsibilities as fathers, and, and that's um, truly what um, I think gets us um, really charged up and, and, and I think um, at the root of every decision that we make and everything that we do, um, you lost your father um, when you were 13 years old. Um, and you had the great benefit of having this wonderful family support. Those that took a chance on you, your grandfather, grandmother, um, that was in, that were in Waterton, um, and um, you know, but you didn't have you know your dad by your side. But you know what it is to be a father, and you know you know how uh, your family unit really gave you the foundation and the inspiration to lead you know such a wonderful life that mattered. Um, and you've got these you know beautiful kids and a loving loving wife. Um, if uh, you were able to have a conversation with your dad, um, you know, what's that conversation um, like that you think that he says to you, um, you know, when you talk about being a father? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think, in truth, we had pretty different life experiences, and, uh, you know, he he built his business from scratch um, and worked his tail off his entire life um, and provided uh, great things for our family. And I feel like I've got that same work ethic. So he probably, first and foremost, would say, 
you know, are you paying enough attention to the work-life balance? And what good, great that you've got great work ethic, but are you really paying enough attention to balance and to what cost there is to having uh, too intensive a focus on work? Um, in, and this may sound like a cop-out, but in some ways, uh, it really is kind of the way I was wired and, and by virtue of the fact that I was never, uh, I never felt like I had um, everything under control ever. I always felt like I had to put in the extra hour, you know, make the extra effort. So it's just, it's really just how I'm wired. Um, now it sounds like an excuse and it sounds terrible when I say it that way, but I think he would probably talk to me about that. I think, um, and Mara has helped me really appreciate that it, from a kid's perspective. She's wise way beyond her years and the impact that it has on her, but also Lena and Leo. Um, and, you know, it's, it really requires you to sort of be present and really present when you're with your family, make the most out of um, the time that you've got together and, um, and really make it a priority. So I think that would be the, the main topic of discussion. I know you'd be proud. Thanks. As are we. Thank you. Much love, brother. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Mark Hopple Mason. Mark, I'd just like to sincerely thank you for so openly and sincerely talking about your wonderful, fascinating, inspirational life and career. It's meant a lot to us. Thank you. And I have up here joining me Peter McMahon, who's the general manager of the Hyatt Regency Atlanta. He's also a very big supporter of the School of Hospitality and on our industry board. We'd like to present you with a token of our appreciation. Thank and much. thank you again. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.